What's up everybody? So I've been talking to people about this topic some lately, so I kind of wanted to come on to a video because it seemed relevant and it's fresh in my mind. So here it goes. So first thing I want to say, um, because I am talking about uh, illegal drugs in this video, um, I'm not um, condoning or advising the use of any illegal drugs. Um, this is for information purposes only. If you're going to do anything of a pharmaceutical nature, uh, consult with your doctor and also consult with your doctor before you begin any nutrition or training program. Um, so that's the disclaimer. Don't come at me um, saying I told you to do anything because that's not what this is. So the other thing I want to, the other disclaimer I want to give, um, ultimately, if your goal is to win bodybuilding shows in whatever division you compete, um, it doesn't really matter what anyone says, what I suggest, what I think is happening, what you think is happening, what you're comfortable with. None of that really matters if the main goal is to win shows. So what I mean by that is if somebody's taking X number of drugs and they come in and they win and their health is relatively, you know, okay, um, you know, obviously that's a little different definition for everybody, but if you come in and you achieve your goal and you, you know, get out on the other side with, you know, um, the best health that you you know can or, or, you know, okay health that you can recover from or, or whatever, then, you know, it doesn't really matter what everybody else is doing or what anybody thinks. Um, because the goal ultimately is to win, uh, you know, win shows if that's, if that's what your goal is. So this is all that I'm about to say. It's all my opinion. Um, there's not a lot of studies on bodybuilders and anabolic usage just because, it's really tough to study bodybuilders because we don't want to give up any of our, um, you know, uh, protocols we've adopted, whether that's training, nutrition, drugs, uh, cardio, whatever it is, we've all pretty much uh, bought into the philosophies and methods that we like. So it's hard to find studies on bodybuilders. Um, and there's aren't that many of us, you know, in, in the world uh, relative to the rest of the population. So again, this is my opinion uh, based on what I've heard, what I've seen, what I've experienced, um, those types of things. So, you know, take this with, you know, as much as you think it's valuable. Um, but like I said, if, if, uh, if I do say anything or, you know, like I said, if I, this is my opinion. So if I do say anything that anybody can dispute with some sort of, um, anecdote or, uh, you know, academic evidence, um, please, by all means, comment below, correct me. And maybe I'll learn something today because I'm always here for that. So what are anabolic steroids? They are testosterone or testosterone derivatives um, designed to originally um, you know, prevent muscle wasting in AIDS patients, cancer patients, um, help with recovery from like burns and things like that. Um, but we as bodybuilders have taken those and made them into something that enhances our performance and improves our body composition um, you know, more so than we could do, you know, with our own bodies and just, you know, normal food and training and cardio and just, you know, over the counter supplements and that sort of thing. Um, so the other, other thing I want to address is like, so who exactly is taking, uh, anabolic steroids in the bodybuilding world? And the answer to that is, could be anybody, could be everybody. Um, you know, I know some high level athletes, um, you know, who don't take anabolics. And I know some amateurs who don't look very good who take a lot of anabolics. So it's, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, magic fix for anything. And it's not necessarily something you have to have depending on what division and, you know, genetics and other factors. Um, for the most part, um, from what I have seen, uh, you know, at high levels, the majority of competitors are on something. Uh, now, like I said, I know at least two off the top of my head that I can think of right now, bikini competitors who are natural and they have you know reached high levels of uh, pro competition. <clears throat> and, you know, neither one of them did it overnight, right? So that's one of those things where it takes time to build a physique. It takes time to get your metabolism in a good place so that you can, you know, survive multiple preps and, and you know, do really well. So, you know, it's, it's, I would say 
you know, based on what I've seen, in my opinion, it's more of an exception uh, than a rule uh, that someone is not doing anything. And that's at the bikini level. Um, from my understanding, I can think of one figure, female, uh, as a pro, um, who is not on anything or wasn't when she got her pro card. Um, uh, she's with a, a coach that I would, you know, trust to say that, um, you know, to, to not say anything if she's enhanced, but she, he mentioned that she was natural. So I'm inclined to believe this, this coach. Um, so those are the only ones I can just off the top of my head think of right now. Uh, so at the amateur level, um, you know, who is on anabolics that you're going against? Again, most everybody, or at least a lot of people, depending on the size of the show, um, depending on, you know, what comes from the show, whether it's a national qualifier, pro qualifier, that sort of thing. But my experience and, and, you know, from what I know, the majority of athletes are on something, um, you know, even at the bikini level. Now, do I think they all should be on something? Not necessarily, definitely not. Um, but I'm just giving the reality that it is, you know, it's, it's a lot more, um, common than, than what I used to think and what a lot of people will also think. So I began my career, uh, as a men's physique competitor, uh, naturally. And I had a little bit of success, went on to do, uh, nationals and got eighth out of 27, uh, in 2016. Um, a lot of the reason I did so well at that show was I was very, very lean. I was very small, um, you know, everybody on stage pretty much uh, probably had 10 or 12 pounds on me. Um, and if not that, they just had a different look um, from the androgens, you know, causing everything to, to be more round and full and, and just look bigger. So and, and more separated and, and all that. So it was very obvious that I was playing a different game than a lot of the guys on the stage, um, you know, whether that's because they were on something or had the genetics to look a certain way. But I didn't have those things. So, you know, I did OK considering, um, but I probably would never win, um, a show, you know, naturally, especially, or, a, you know, a pro qualifier naturally, especially not with the way that the, the criteria has gone for men's physique lately. Those guys are massive. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with, you know, some of the anabolics that they're using. So my understanding of the classic division is, you know, there are a couple people that I know of who have claimed to be natural, um, and have had some success. Um, and, and then there is somebody in men's physique that I know, or that I, or a couple in men's physique as pros that I'm pretty sure at least used to be natural who had some success, you know, at that point. So, you know, it's as females, you know, there are probably way more bikini girls at the pro level and high level nationals and that sort of thing who are not on anything than any other division, uh, because bikini is the most attainable physique from, in terms of muscularity and conditioning and, fullness and hardness and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's kind of rambly, but basically, you know, the takeaway from that is the majority of competitors are using something. And, um, you know, if you go against them, not using anything, you are at a disadvantage because no matter how hard you work or how strict you are on your diet, perfect with cardio, all that stuff, you're still missing something that can make you a completely different physique. Um, you know, and that's just, it just is what it is. There's no, no judgment for me from either side or whatever. It's just, you know, science. So basically, um, you know, that's, that's who's taking it. Um, hopefully that wasn't, um, super unclear. So <clears throat> the next thing I would say is like, what, you know, kind of, um, things are people taking? And this is not going to be super in-depth at all. It's going to be very, very, very vague, very broad, um, you know, and, and could could definitely change from person to person. But I just want to give an idea of what some of the potential you know things to use have been that I've experienced. So for bikini, um, typically, you know, Anavar is going to be your go-to. And for a lot of competitors, that's pretty much the top of it. I know for most of my bikini competitors, that's, I don't recommend much more than that. Um, Usually you're looking at two and a half, five, ten milligrams at the most, um, you know, and, and you have to, you might want to pull that back depending on how they look and how they're, you know, feeling and side effects and that kind of thing. And I'll go over side effects a little bit after I kind of mention all this. Um, so, you know, the bikini level, those are pretty much the only things. There might be some type of, uh, you know, estrogen control being used. Um, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use 
uh, an aromatase inhibitor, um, but maybe something, you know, that's going to be a receptor modulator like Novodex might, might make a little bit of sense to help with some fat loss. Um, but there are some side effects to consider with that as well. Um, but that's pretty much it. I mean, there's a lot of clenbuterol used <clears throat> in the bikini world just because it does help with fat loss from a receptor site standpoint. Um, and also, you know, it can give you a little bit of energy and, and increase metabolic rate um, to an extent. Um, or at least in the, in the sense that you're <clears throat> feeling some energy and some um, twitchiness and that kind of stuff. So, you know, you are going to burn some more calories on it as well. Um, and then T3, uh, you know, can be used uh, at any, any level, uh, for fat loss. Um, for the longest time, I've always sort of been last resort uh, as far as T3, just because it's such a hard thing to kind of come off of and you feel really bad from it. And, you know, there aren't, there's not really any data suggesting that it doesn't replace itself. Like if you come off of it, your body will, you know, get back to normal. Um, but it's a, it's a, a kind of annoying process because you feel sort of terrible for a little bit and you, you know, you're in a kind of a weird window where your metabolism is really slow and you know, your hunger is at its highest. So, you, you know, you might put on some additional fat post show or post diet or whatever, if you come off a of T3. So that's, that's not my favorite thing to use. Um, but as of lately, I've been going to a little bit more just because, you know, it's conditioning has been, been prioritized so much, um, at the NPC and the IFBB that it's something that, you know, can help you achieve conditioning, you know, that, that could put you up ahead of everybody else. So I've been going to that a little bit more lately than I ever, you know, would have in the past. Um, but like I said, that's one of those things that you can recover from. It doesn't really have many side effects unless you just really abuse it. Um, and then, you know, as you go up, uh, females, you know, you can add in other compounds. Um, I really like primavolin, uh, for females. If you can find real primavolin, um, that's the tricky part because most of the time it is probably something else. Um, I've even seen that happen to one of my athletes. Um, she was, she was on some primavolin and started basically having a side effects of testosterone. And so we took her off primavolin and the side effects went away. And so, you know, that was probably not primavolin, it was probably testosterone. And that is not super uncommon because primavolin is very hard to find. Um, so if I can get real primavolin, then obviously it's, you know, it's going to be a good one to use. So, you know, from figure up to, or, you know, wellness up to figure all the way to physique and bodybuilding, um, you know, it gets progressively more intense as far as, you know, what you're using. Um, and I've heard of some females using Mastron, uh, not a huge proponent of that for a very long time, especially, um, because it is a DHT derivative, which, um, does pretty much, it's pretty much a precursor to male sex characteristics. So if you're if you're a female taking Mastron for very long, you might end up with some, some of the side effects that you don't necessarily want. Primavolin is, is the same way, but it's just not as strong. Um, so that would be kind of my stance on that. Uh, you know, I probably would never use Trimbolone on a female. I just, I can't think of a situation where that makes sense. Um, DECA would not be something I would use on a female um, because the, the ester is longer. And so it takes a little longer to absorb. Um, so it takes longer to build up in your system. And then once you do want to get off of it, if you're having some side effects or whatever, it takes longer to get out of your system. So if I'm going to use an androlone for female, it would be NPP, um, which I have not done yet. Uh, and it would have to be the right situation for that. Um, as far as uh, growth hormone, um, I do think there's a, a really good place for growth hormone in females. Um, I think it really helps with fat loss uh, and fullness. Um, I wouldn't go more than one or two IUs a day uh, for a female. And so that's pretty much what I would be, what, you, what you're looking at as far as, you know, like I said, my opinion on, on what females are using theirs. Um, you know, testosterone is definitely something that can be u utilized in females. Um, but it's also very important to be careful with that because, you know, you're very likely to end up with some side effects if you stay on it for too long or use too much. Um, and also everyone responds a little bit differently. So that's kind of, um, kind of important there. Um, as far as the men, um, you know, usually I'm going to start off with just uh, a little bit of testosterone because if you raise testosterone in a man, um, you know, above normal levels, muscle building is going to improve. It just is. That's 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 simple. Um, so that would be a great place to start. See what you can get out of that uh, before you add any other anabolics to it. Um, I'm not going to go in depth into what all I would use for different 
categories or times or whatever. But basically with men, you know, there's not really anything that's off limits because you don't have to worry about the side effects uh, as far as that goes. Um, but you do have to mitigate some of the estrogen levels from different compounds and that kind of thing. So those are important things to consider as well, uh, especially if you've got somebody that's sensitive to estrogen or prolactin. You know, you got to be careful with the 19 nor, um, you know, the, the Trimalone, Deca, MPP, those. You have to be careful with those if somebody's, you know, um, susceptible to prolactin issues. Um, so anyway, so some of the side effects that, you know, that men can get, um, if you're not careful, you know, you can end up with high blood pressure, you can end up with acne, um, which is pretty common, you know, one of those things you sort of mitigate from the outside, like using scrubs and brushes and that sort of thing. Um, you can end up with breast tissue if your estrogen gets too high, um, or, you know, you have an imbalance of testosterone and estrogen. Um, you can end up with breast tissue and gynecomastia, which is obviously not good, and you have to have surgery to remove it if it gets too far. Um, so there are ways to mitigate that, you know, via estrogen control. So Nolvidex, Rimidex, Letrozole, uh, Clomid, uh, Ximostain, Aromacin, those things. You can use all those, you know, in different ways to mitigate estrogen problems. And then, you know, beyond that, you know, any anabolics you use, there are different ones for maybe different phases, only because of the amount of water retention and uh, conversion to estrogen that they have. You know, anything can pretty much be used at any time as long as you manage it properly. Um, but there are certain things that are just a little bit easier in each phase uh, as far as that goes. Um, but as far as like what divisions and who's using what, um, you know, I think at any level, you're going to run into some physique, physique guys that are on stuff, you know, the majority, especially at nationals and, and, you know, the pro level. And then anything above that, you know, everybody's using something just about if they're, you know, if they're successful or just not a, you know, a genetic freak, um, so, you know, just know going in, you're probably going against somebody that's on something, um, you know, if you're competing. Um, some of the female side effects to look out for, same thing as far as the acne. Um, you can end up with some voice deepening. Uh, the vocal cords will actually grow uh, on anabolics. It's, you know, it's kind of like puberty for men. Same same type of situation is happening on females. It's just that you're using it, you're, you're, you're inducing it via drugs versus natural, you know, growth and, and maturation. And then... Uh, uh, clitoral enlargement, you can have that, uh, from the anabolics. So, you know, that's, if that's something that you don't want happening. then that's something to, to keep an eye on if you're, you know, depending on what you're taking and how long and that sort of thing, you know, it's important for females to, to cycle off, um, pretty regularly, uh, in order to mitigate side effects, you know, depending on how much you're, you know, how, how you're responding to those things. So that's just something to keep in mind too. If you're, you know, if you're a female, you know, you want to make sure you have, some pretty <clears throat> definitive times off, you know, so that your body can get back to baseline and, and not, you know, um, retain those side effects. So this leads me to the question of the video, right? So should you be taking anabolics? And this is a, extremely dependent on each person and tons of different factors. So, um, you know, the first thing I want to ask is, is why, right? Like, why would you want to take anabolics? So if your goal with competing in bodybuilding is to win and to be the best you can be, um, you know, in an organization that is not a drug tested federation, then, you know, yeah, you should definitely take something. But, you know, the other side of that is have you weighed out the risks, um, you know, against that? Because there are, there are a lot of risks. Um, you know, you can look at you know, this, gosh, the last five years as a whole in bodybuilding and, you know, there have been a lot of deaths, a lot of sickness, those types of things. So, you know, and, and some of those are, are, you know, of no fault of, of anyone necessarily it might be an underlying condition or whatever. So there are risks. Um, so you have to, to consider those things, but the, the, you know, to back to the question is, you know, should you take anything? Um, you know, if you want to compete at a high level, uh, have success, um, in most divisions, uh, assuming you're not, you know, genetically superior to everyone, even if they're on anabolics, then yeah, you should probably take something. Um, but that's a decision you have to weigh out for yourself, each individual person. You know, if you have a spouse, if you have kids, if you have a uh, significant other, whatever, that's a decision you guys need to make, you know, together because it does affect, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, from a day to day perspective and just, you know, a, a health perspective as well. So, 
you know, that's, it has to be, it depends on what your goals are, right? If you just want to compete, you know, at a local level, um, you know, win some shows, you know, in your area, um, you know, just get a little better each year. Um, then no, I mean, it's not worth the risk at that point. Um, you know, it depends on what competing means to you and what it is for you. You know, if you're trying to make a career of it, you're trying to, um, you know, make it a business kind of like what I'm doing. You know, I'm the reason I'm coaching people now is because I started competing myself. One of my friends asked me to coach him. And then, you know, one of his friends asked me to coach him and then, you know, it kind of took off from there, you know, slowly uh, up until this year. So had I not been competing, I, I probably would have never picked up that first competitor client because it's, it just wouldn't make sense for people to ask me to do that unless I had somebody, you know, who, who knew me and trusted me to do it, even though I had not been through a prep before, but that's rare. Um, you know, usually even, even the big name coaches who don't compete and have been in years and years, at least competed at some point. So if you're trying to make a career of it, um, you know, or be really successful as a competitor, uh, then yeah, you probably need to be on something, you know, depending on again, the division and your genetics. Um, but again, that's a decision you have to weigh out, um, very heavily. Um, you know, my general philosophy on things like that is that you should start with the least amount necessary to get results. Um, you know, ride that out until you plateau and, you know, until you're not seeing results anymore. And, and only then should you increase, um, all of that with the caveat that your nutrition, your training, your sleep, um, your stress levels, everything is, you know, in a great place for you to grow or lose fat, depending on what your goals are at the time, you know, or to keep muscle or whatever it is. Um, you know, you want to make sure all the factors are in place before you start throwing anabolics on top. So that's my philosophy is to use as little as possible, um, get the results that you need and only increase, you know, when necessary. And then obviously try to make sure you take care of, uh, health on, you know, on the other side of, of everything. So even while you're on a cycle or after a cycle or before a cycle, it's important to get blood work done, make sure blood pressure is good. All your health, you know, is good in, in every way that it can be as good as it can be in order to protect yourself long term and just so that you don't have any issues, you know, in, in the process either. Um, you know, just, this is super rambly, um, you know, but I just wanted to get some thoughts out there. Um, just, if you take anything away from this, it, it should be this, you know, guys know that going into this sport, you know, in, a, in an organization that is not drug tested, you're probably going to be competing against people who are on anabolics. Um, so just go, going in, know that, um, and don't be upset if you decide not to use them and you don't win because the people are using them. That's just part of it. Go do a drug test organization. There's no shame. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, just know that you're playing a different game than the people that are enhanced and you, you know, you're probably not going to beat them. Um, you know, unless they just don't bring proper conditioning or have really bad genetics, or if you have really good genetics or whatever. But the point is just know that going into competing, you're going against people who are on anabolics and, and, you know, and that's okay. That's part of the sport. Um, like I said, there are federations that do drug tests and if that's your preference, then go do those. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, the other side of that, um, if you want to be successful in the sport, in most divisions, including bikini, um, you probably need something. Um, I said probably. Again, it's not. I'm not saying everyone has to have something. But the majority of people who are successful at a high level are doing something. And so you, you'll probably need to as well. Um, and it's important that you get a coach you trust and do your own research uh, as well so that you know what you're putting in your body, you know the potential risks, and if something does happen, you have to be okay with those and not blame anyone, um, you know, for misinformation or whatever because it's, you know, ultimately it's your decision. So, you know, know what you're doing as well as, you know, taking advice from someone, you, your people that you trust, you know, on, on that as well. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, like I said, these are all my opinions. Um, it's just based on what I've seen, what I've learned, what I've heard. Um, and, you know, again, very broad, you know, I didn't give any protocols or suggestions or anything like that. That's not what I'm here to do today. Um, but I just kind of want to get the information out there. Um, the other thing I had somebody ask me in a Q and a recently, you know, what would I do if I had an athlete that I thought needed to be on PEDs and, you know, wasn't yet, you know, how would I have that conversation whatever? Um, you know, it's important as coaches that we're straightforward with our athletes. we got to manage expectations. Um, I hear that all the time, and, you know, it's really important. So, you know, if you have an athlete that you think, you know, needs to know, you know, that – well, every athlete needs to know this, but if you have an athlete that you think, you know, 
could benefit from anabolics depending on, you know, their aspirations and their, you know, current level and that sort of thing. You know, if that's something you're comfortable having your athletes do, it's important to have that conversation and then give the athlete the freedom to make that choice. Um, you know, if I have an athlete that I recommend anabolics to, or we have that conversation and they're not comfortable with it or they don't want to do it, then that's fine. I'm going to coach them naturally. And, and there won't be another word mentioned about it unless they bring it up. You know, I'm not trying to pressure anybody into doing anything. Um, I'm just trying to give out the information and, you know, let everyone make their own decisions you know, about that. So that's the thing. Ultimately, it's your decision. Um, hopefully this gives a little insight on things. Um, like I said, it was kind of rambly, but if you guys have any follow up questions or if I said anything that was just blatantly stupid, feel free to put that below um, and comment. Let me know. Um, but I appreciate you guys if you stayed with this one and I will talk to you guys next time.